to hear from um, some poultry producers uh, this morning. A couple things I want to say first. As an educator, I want to make sure people understand this. Um, we talk about litter and manure, and we kind of use that interchangeably. So manure is actually the feces. As Gary Kelman would say, it's the poop that comes out of the um, bird. The litter is actually the mixture of the manure and the, the shavings or the sawdust that we start in our houses, and that's what we market. So I wanted people to understand that. Um, I heard Earl, s someone said waste. What do we do with the waste? We do not call it waste because it's nutrient rich. It has nitrogen, it has phosphorus, it has potassium, it has lots of organic matter. So that's one of the words I don't like to hear. The other thing um, when we talk about litter, um, I like to call it locally produced organic slow release plant food. So like Bill said, if you don't remember anything else today, think about that. It's a locally produced, it's organic, it's a slow release, and it's plant food. So that's one thing I've been trying to teach my um, grandchildren. Fertilizer sometimes, the chemicals have negative, kind of negative, just people think bad about it, I want to say. So if we talk about plant food, that's a good thing. We have to eat, plants have to eat. So, so we'll get started. Um, so I put together, um, today after some um, chatting with uh, local farmers about a panel. We thought that it would be very important that you hear from the people that do this uh, work um, day to day. So I'm going to have each one of them introduce themselves, um, talk a little bit about their operation, and as you um, hear them, write down some questions and we'll um, talk about that. I also put together um, a PowerPoint presentation that's going to run in the background that might give you some ideas and if you have any questions about those we'll um, be certainly, um, we'll certainly take care of those. Uh, one other thing uh, you'll see on the last slide is that at the University of Maryland we have put together our broiler production management um, bulletin for um, potential and existing growers. In that also is a glossary because you're going to hear lots of terms today that you may not understand. If you don't under those, understand those terms, look them up or, or let us know. So we will get started. So first we're going to start with um, Andrew McLean. So Andrew uh, is from um, Queen Anne's County. His farm is called Relief Farm. So Andrew, I'll let you start. Well, I grew up working on a family dairy farm. After college, I was an ag lender for 28 years, traveling all over Delmarva. I got to uh, see and lend money to all different kinds of uh, agricultural operations. Um, about 12 years ago, uh, we sold a uh, farm that had been in the family and bought the farm behind where we lived. And I wondered what to do with it. I thought about grain, but I lacked the expertise. It requires a large capital investment and a large land base. I only had about a third of the acreage that I would need to make a good grain farm. Uh, I thought about vegetables or nursery, but again, I lacked the expertise. It has a smaller, potentially smaller capital investment, um, but it requires a lot of labor and the marketing. So then I thought about chickens. It has a large capital investment, but it's lower labor, and the expertise in the marketing is largely handled by the company. So I settled on putting up poultry houses. Uh, uh, two years ago, I switched over to, from conventional chickens to growing organic chickens. I take care of six houses with uh, some help from my son, who's getting ready to go off to college. So. We'll see how, what I do in the future, but I can handle the six houses myself pretty well. Um, the organic, I did that because that seemed to be the direction that the company that I grew for was going in, in my area. And, you know, I'm, it's what the customers want. And that's what I'm here to do. Plus, I wanted to see if I could make more money off of the same buildings. In a typical day, I spend the morning in the poultry houses uh, making sure that everything works right. Today was a typical morning. I had a water leak in one house and a pile of feed and, uh, from a pipe coming off in, in another house. So I spent uh, part of the morning cleaning that up. I had to get started early today. Um, what time did you get started, Andrew? I got started at 4.30. That's what I felt. <laughs> um, but that's what I do. I mean, I typically spend the morning in the poultry houses 
and the afternoons doing repairs, mowing at this time of year, and uh, going to meetings. I spend roughly 50 hours a week, give or take, um, in the operation. But you're on call 24 hours a day, and not atypical from what I did the rest of my working life, I pretty much live my job. I mean, whenever we go somewhere, if I happen to need something, I stop in and get it. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the morning in the chicken house, again, everything is about the animal welfare, making that animal, uh, making the chickens uh, happy and healthy, uh, making sure that the feed is there, the water is there, the air quality is good. Um, and with the organic, the main difference is that they can go outside, and I enjoy seeing them go outside. Uh, you also put in windows to have natural light inside and entertainment centers for the chickens because you have to keep them entertained. Um, the meetings that I go to, I'm on the uh, Delmarva Land and Litter Steering Committee and the DPI Board and Hughes Agroecology Center and also the local Soil Conservation Board. Um, so that's pretty much what I do. Okay, all right, good. Katie, so Katie um, Winstead is from One Hall Farm. Okay. I'm Katie Winstead. I was um, born in East and raised in Queen Anne's County. My parents had a poultry operation when I was younger and we lived next to a dairy farm. So um, agriculture was something that I loved from, you know, being very, a very small child. I spent a lot of time in the chicken houses. And um, as I grew up, I, I graduated high school. I pursued my career in nursing, uh, which was great. So I graduated nursing school in 2007. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I graduated with Andrew's wife is why I looked at him. We graduated <laughs> together. Um, um, so my husband and I then had two children. I was pursuing my graduate degree. All the while, I had kind of had in the back of my mind, it was always my dream to have my own farm. But I wanted to get my career going first. Um, so then we had our third child, and I wrapped up grad school and I found the perfect farm located outside of Denton, and we purchased it, and it took a, a long time for those who know the struggle, um, but finally we got, about a year after we purchased it, we purchased it in July of 2015, and my houses were complete in August of 2016, so I'm just now on my, I'm getting ready to get my fifth flock, and I grow antibiotic-free birds for Alan Harim. And my three young children are my youngest employees. So I have a nine-year-old employee, a seven-year-old employee, and a three-and-a-half-year-old employee. Right now, I pay them in Slurpees. I don't think that's going to last much longer, but for right now, they're content with that. All right. Uh, Bill Darling is here from Trinity Farm. Yeah, my name's uh, Bill Darling. I, I've been growing chickens for about 30 years, but uh, uh, my grandfather and great-grandfather were dairy farmers. And my father bought his first farm in 71 outside Centerville. And back then we had to feed by hand and water by hand. Uh, we changed after that. And uh, I was in, uh, in the 4-H into FFA when I got to high school. And when I got uh, my license, I started milking cows for a local dairy farmer until I got married. And I had an opportunity to manage a farm uh, down in the Salisbury area, which uh, supplied us uh, just being married and a child on the way, uh, it supplied us with a house and a good experience. So we stayed down there for nine years, uh, grew the farm to uh, also include uh, 40 head of beef and 100 hogs, we, uh, grain, and we did some hay there. And uh, in the meantime, we had a couple of more children. So we had three children. Uh, in 96, we had an opportunity to uh, build houses on my family's farm that had been in my family since 29. So we built four houses there. And uh, we are currently growing 104,000 for uh, Mount Air. Uh, my Family has been a big uh, part of helping uh, with growing chickens because the farm I was managing down there uh, in the Salisbury area, the owner asked me to stay on while I was, once I moved up here. So I did both farms for uh, 17 years uh, of 60 miles apart. So that was a little bit of a challenge in finding tenants to uh, stay in there because I had to go through quite a few uh, tenants. 
but we did both places for 17 years. Uh, my son has grown up doing it from the time he was six, and now he, he and I are raising beef where we're at, and uh, hay and straw, and uh, we started about 10 years ago doing crusting together, and he mainly runs that now. Um, uh, which he's a big help. Um, I've got four grandchildren, and actually, uh, the uh, my son and his wife had their first child, which was William the fourth, which would be hopefully uh, the sixth generation on this family farm. Uh, if we, uh, I'm hoping that we can last that long anyway. But, uh, um, and I'm part of the Rortan, Sullivansville Rortan. Uh, I've been on the DPI board and the Farm Bureau board for years, and uh, I think that's about it. Okay, that's good. All right, so I'll um, talk to you a little bit about uh, my operation. So I grew up here in Queen Anne's County. I tell people I haven't gone far because I uh, still live in the same county and work in the same county and very, and very happy um, to do that. But my dad had, had a grain operation and had beef cows. Um, later on, and when I got out of school, um, I really, I worked at a local bank, and, but I really wanted to have my own farm, and I, the poultry industry was really the only way that I could get um, into farming. I could go to the company, could get a contract, it gave me a minimum pay. I don't, certainly don't want to make that minimum base pay, but I can go to the bank and say, look, I'm going to make this much money, I know I can make my payments, and that's how the poultry in industry really started for me. At the time I was married, um, had two small children, um, went along fine. Um, my ex-husband decided he didn't want to do it anymore, so he exited it about seven years, and I decided I'm not going to sell my farm. I grew up on a farm, and I want my children to grow up on a farm. If I don't teach my children anything else, I'm going to teach them responsibility, and I'm going to teach them how to manage money, because I think that is very important that a lot of children really um, miss out on, I think, some, some time. So I worked a full-time job. I took care of four houses with my sons. They were um, eight and 10 years old when my uh, husband left at the time. I couldn't have done that without my family. My mom and my dad, my brother helped me raise um, my children. So um, I always tell people, you know, whatever you want in life, you can do, but you just have to figure out um, how to get there, and for me, that was family and a lot of good friends also um, that you know helped me along the way. Um, like Bill, I've been um, I was thinking this morning it's been 30 years that um, since I've owned my farm, and um, like Bill Satterfield said this morning, lots of changes. When I um, first bought my farm, we had the trough um, drinkers, and I'd had my farm about six months, and then the nipple drinkers came out, and you know we we another you know investment but you have to keep up with technology and technology um, is very important so my children grew up uh, my two sons Chris and Ryan now they're 30 and 32 grew up on the farm helping me they worked with my dad worked in my with my brother um, in the grain uh, their grain operation and they like um, myself wanted to have their own um, their own operation so my youngest son a year and a half ago was able to buy a farm that was actually right down the road um, from my farm which worked out very well, so he helps to manage uh, my farm now and uh, take care of his farm. In the meantime, I had bought a farm on the other side of Centerville. It's a grain uh, operation. We have irrigation uh, there. My oldest son lives there with um, his wife, and I have three grandchildren. He has two boys, so like Katie, I have some labor that's uh, five years old, uh, three years old, and the Oliver's only uh, one year, so he has a little bit of time. Um, but, it, you know, it's very important for people to understand that we do um, incorporate children and, um, into our business. My oldest son um, was just bought a farm actually several um, months ago, and he will be um, putting up uh, four houses for um, Coleman, for Purdue. He'll be growing um, organic chicken. So I want you to understand that this is the way for young farmers. This is the way that they can get into, they can buy a farm, establish a farming operation, um, both of my sons, both of their farms have um, tillable ground, so with the help of my dad and my brother, they'll be able to plant corn and wheat and, and soybeans. So I think that's um, one of the most important things. Uh, it's been a, um, a great profession for me. I have met so many people, been involved in so many things. I've been on the Delmarva um, Poultry uh, Industry Board. I've been on the GER Committee. 
Um, you know, I've done a lot of different things, served on a lot of um, committees. Now I am uh, serve as vice chair of Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit, and I find that very gratifying to see how we lend and we keep rural America uh, going. So the, I, and that's another takeaway that I want you to see. I've served in other organizations, other types of people, and all these people take their time, their free time to give back um, to our organizations and our nonprofits, which is, is very important. So I will um, stop right here, and then if you'll grab us some um, questions, we'll work on some questions. So while you're um, doing that, I want each one of you to tell me what's the best thing about growing chickens? I personally like the autonomy. It sounds a little silly because, like Andrew said, it is a 24-7 job, but you can kind of schedule your day around it. You mm -hmm. know, so I get up and I check on chickens and then I put my children on the bus and then I get my cup of coffee and I go out and I hang out with my chickens and I see how they're feeling and I sit, you know, flip my bucket over and I look at them and see, you know, what they're doing and sip my coffee. But, you know, it, it kind of, and like when the children have field trips and activities, I can kind of tailor my schedule around them. And I still work as a nurse as well. I still work um, every weekend as a nurse with... Andrew's wife, actually. Go ahead. Well, uh, I like being my own boss, too, and uh, it, it gives me a chance to, I love phone with the gals. Uh, I guess I guess that from my grandfather. Uh, so it gives me a chance to, my main uh, job is tending to the chickens, but I also be able to uh, have the cow-cow operation where uh, I can check on the, when I'm checking on the chickens, I get to check on the gals having the calves in the spring and doing, be able to do the hay and work around it. If I had an off-the-farm job doing the hay, and, uh, it would be hard. And, and, uh, but I just love the farm and uh, for a small operation, uh, growing chickens uh, give me that chance to farm full-time. Andrew? Well, the autonomy is great, as Katie said, and um, probably having my son grow up helping me it's been a lot of fun watching him grow up and, you know, and certainly having him help me along the way. Okay. All right. We have all kinds of questions, so you guys, um, ladies, better uh, get ready. Um, so I have one question um, that talks about, for all speakers, um, they want you to talk about your um, debt um, to the poultry companies and um, talk about maybe how much money, not how much money you owe, but I think the, probably the question concerned maybe around, you know, we hear lots of talk how the poultry companies um, keep us in debt. So how would you um, answer that question, Andrew? Well, first of all, I don't owe the poultry companies any money. I owe the bank money. Very good. Um, secondly, being a lender in this, there's a reason that we put them on 15-year terms. It's because by the end of 15 years, you're going to start to have the upgrades and replacements of things so that you have the cash flow to handle that. And uh, even at this point in time, mine are 11 years old. I, I schedule out so much money per year that I plan on uh, you know, making replacements and upgrades and things like that. It's all in how you run your business. And, um, you know, the uh, amount of money that we pay back is, is very high. I mean, you can pay them off in 15 years. Okay. All right. Um, as a poultry farmer, what is your greatest challenge or, challenge or concern about your future? What's your greatest challenge? Start with that, maybe. I would have to say at this, I'm new at this, um, but staying abreast of the, of the technology and being able to financially sustain sustainability is very important for me. My parents actually got out of poultry because they were faced with the decision that I think every poultry grower that's in it for a long period of time is faced with. Um, you know, the company wants you to do a certain amount of upgrades because the research and the technology shows that that grows, that's, you know, more efficient. It's a better way to grow chickens. And, you know, you have to make that decision. Do we want to take out that chunk of money or do we not? Um, so I think that's probably, you know, right now I'm starting with brand new equipment. Obviously, I just built my houses, but I'm already anticipating in seven, eight, ten years, like I'm structuring my financial stuff so that I can face those challenges. Okay. Bill, you going to answer that? My, I, I would say I'm uh, more worried about the uh, 
uh, environment that uh, uh, for his regulations and uh, uh, the government issues by running the companies off the shore. I mean, uh, uh, every year it seems like it make it harder and harder for the, uh, you know, everybody to stay in business and we need the companies as farmers and the you know, companies need us, but uh, if the companies move off the shore, you know, it's gonna be a lot of people out of business and I'm hoping to uh, pass this business farm that's been in my family all these years onto my son and hopefully my grandson uh, so, you know, that's what mm -hmm. I worry about. Okay. All right. This is a question. Can you make a living with poultry? It's a high capital investment. Can you live off of poultry or do you need supplement um, income, energy costs, lending opportunities? How would you answer that one? <laughs> I, I obviously still work as a nurse. Um, I think that, you know, for a married couple, I think it's ideal that somebody also work off the farm. And most of that is not necessarily for um, income, although that is nice to have the extra income, um, but for benefit purposes as well, for health care and that type thing. And that's what I look at having three children. You know, I work for University of Maryland for regional health, and I'm very lucky. I have, I have good benefits and I have a good opportunity there. But if I had to pay out of pocket, you know, if I was just self-employed with just my poultry business, um, that would probably be, that would probably put me out of the reach of, you know, affording health insurance for my family. Okay. I work uh, full time doing this. Like I said, I've been doing it for almost 30 years. Uh, but I'd say about 15 years ago when insurance was uh, getting out of our reach, my wife had to go to work in the school system mm -hmm. just for the insurance. So mm -hmm. one of us has got to work off the farm uh, for one reason or the other. Mm -hmm. And I see, I think typically that's what you see, you know, one person is home taking care of the farm and then a, another person is working off the farm. Andrew? Well, making the jump from being a banker to being a full-time chicken rancher, um, I looked at the numbers pretty hard, and we've not seen any decline in our standard of living from giving up that day job. Okay. All right. Um, many in the environmental community demise chicken growers as big polluters. Please explain your on-farm environmental practices. So talk to us about some of your um, buffers or heavy use area pads, whatever else you might do environmentally. Go ahead and start. You don't wanna. Well, as far as my place goes, uh, we, we put in the heavy use uh, cement pads around the chicken houses on the manure shed. We keep all our manure and actually we added a, a manure shed for the cows and a heavy use lane and a, a cement for the cows. Uh, we have tree buffers around the uh, chicken houses. And uh, on the one side, I got 30 acres of woods. We have set aside grass on the back part of this uh, farm. Um, and most or all of my manure is uh, hauled away by local farmers. So uh, from the chicken house to the manure shed, out the lane. So but we have all these uh, that we, we do on our place. Right. I think one of the things that, um, you know, people think, uh, when you think about environmentally, people think that we have these large areas of litter, you know, just laying around and, you know, all of our litter is in our houses or in, you know, um, our manure storage buildings. So what other environmental things? Um, Katie, you have? Well, mine's pretty new, but I was, you know, in on the design of it and everything, and I have a, it's a approximately... 11 or 12 acres and everything was designed so it drains right into my um, retention pond so nothing will leave you know that specified uh, location the actual location I, I do you know if it were and luckily we had a lot of rain when I first put up my chicken houses back in October and um, it, it was beautiful everything went down the swales through the four bay landed right in the pond exactly how it was supposed to be um, so I have a lot of faith in that unless we had you know an unreal storm everything is going to stay right in that location um, my manure is always covered of course this is my first few flocks so I've just gotten this is the first time we actually crossed it out and took manure out of the house um, after the the chickens leave we always sweep off the pads sweep all the manure back in the house there's very little manure that comes out of the house actually um, you know I think that's a discrepant people think that there's a lot of manure that comes in and out of the house there's not really um, we do brush off our pads and do that type thing but you know I let my kids swim in the pond it's not like I think it's you know a polluted area there's most of its rainwater that comes off of the roof That's right. 
Um, all right, I'd, I'd say probably one of the other things, I mean, we all have, um, you know, grass around our poultry houses that certainly acts as a na natural filter. So, you know, we don't have gutters on our chicken houses. So when that water comes off the roofs, um, we have a natural, you know, buffered um, area for the rain to, uh, you know, filter through. A lot of us have, um, Jennifer, and you'll see some pictures up here, um, some are from my farm of the uh, vegetative, um, buffers we put in and the grasses i love the grasses we have miscanthus and we have switch grass um, that we plant um, there's a picture right there that's been planted um, right and that's all around those those fans so when those fans come on it catches the the dust um, that comes out and it's been um, it's worked very 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 um, well for us i was just trying to think of any other, oh I, um jennifer timmons was talking a little bit about um, manure and or litter, whatever you want to call. Um, so let's talk about the ways that we handle it. Um, Jennifer talked about crusting or caking out. Um, do any of you do um, in-house composting or windrowing? So talk about how that affects uh, maybe the amount of litter that you might have. Well, there are new ways that we handle litter. It used to be that you did a whole house clean out fairly often. Um, now we don't do the whole house cleanouts all that often, and in fact, for the first three or four flocks uh, after I put in new litter, I just went in with a litter saver and uh, ground it up. So the amount of crust, the amount of litter that we're taking out of the houses is less now than it was even just a couple of years ago. So we have new ways that we're handling it, um, certainly doing the windrowing. Again, that's another avenue of uh, handling the litter, cleaning the house out without actually taking anything out of it. And litter compared to other protein, other animal manure is dry and it's easily handled. True, true. And, and it is a commodity. It is something that um, we as farmers um, can sell. So, you know, 12 to $15 a ton, it's very, you know, nutrient, has, has the nutrients in it that other farmers are looking for. Bill, you want? Uh, we do both as far as windrowing and crusting. Uh, um, try to do it a couple times a year to windrow. And then, like you say, uh, there's no manure coming out when you windrow. And uh, like I had mentioned uh, earlier, uh, my son and I uh, have a crusting business where we clean out for other farmers. And a lot of people have gone to uh, in-house windrowing uh, so to save the litter and uh, benefit the chickens in the long run. So. Okay. Um, Bill, let's talk a little bit about um, 30 years ago when you and I started uh, growing chickens and the technology um, that we probably didn't have. So let's talk about the technology that um, we have today that, that we can use. Well, the, tech, the biggest uh, in, in mine is, is the computers uh, and the, the curtain Put machines. That and, Put that closer. The curtain machines and the vent machines uh, because uh, even... 30 years ago when I started, I mean, we naturally ventilated. We had the troughs, you got the nipple drinkers, but you don't have to, uh, to wash the troughs anymore or hand feed anymore. Yeah, hand feed. Uh, and you had to be there to put the curtains up and down. Uh, even when I built my uh, farm in uh, 96, we still had curtains and uh, had tunnel, tunnel ventilation, which was new then, uh, but you still had to hand put them curtains up and down, mm -hmm. whereas today, uh, with these computers, uh, it's all good as long as everything works right. It's a lot more. It, uh, my, I worry a lot about it. Uh, my wife says, uh, you know, you've been doing a long time. It's, it's a lot of good things that takes us, uh, saves us labor. But uh, if something happens, you know, you, you've mm -hmm. got to be there to uh, try to make it right. So right. that's the biggest thing to me is computers uh, opening and closing them vents and uh, mm -hmm. curtains and uh, turning your coolant on and off, stuff that we used to do manual, right. uh, and uh, with thermostats, which used to be, they were very reliable, but there was a lot of play in thermostats. Mm -hmm. You might have to kick them off in the, or kick them on in the morning and kick them off at nighttime. Right. Right. So you spent a lot of time right. right there. Andrew, you want to talk about some of your technology, Katie? Well, I mean, having the computer and one of the nice things is I've already checked the chickens twice since I've been here. That's right, yeah. That's by the right. phone. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly looking at my phone or at home 
being on the computer, mm -hmm. checking out, making sure that everything's working properly. Right. So it, it doesn't substitute us being in the houses, but when we're away, it can be, you know, we can see what's the average temperature, how many, how many fans are on. I mean, there's a whole list of, of things that, you know, and it really has made us, um, you know, better growers every morning. We can check to see how many heaters have um, run at night, how long they've been running, what's the water consumption. If our birds aren't drinking, that we know, you know, that's the first sign of, you know, something's wrong. So there's lots of um, technology. And, you know, I carry my iPad and my phone wherever I go. And people are like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm checking my chickens, uh, you know. So it's a... Well, the other thing about the computers and looking on your phone and stuff that I've uh, picked up over the years, uh, you can, in my case, four houses, you can see all four houses at the same time. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you went in house by house, I don't know about anybody else, right. you might not pick up something uh, of the difference in the water or the difference mm -hmm. in the temperature or how many fans are running. But when That's you're looking true. at all four houses, in my case, at the same time, why is there uh, the water a couple of hundred gallons down? versus the other right. house, there's right. usually a reason, you know, That's true. there's a feed hopper hung up or something That's like that, uh, uh, that you can see a lot faster than going mm -hmm. from house to house. Yes. Okay. So. All right, we've done that one. Okay, here's a new question. Um, some have criticized the way growers are paid and said that all growers should be, play, be paid a flat rate regardless of performance. Do you agree with this or not? Why or why not? Um, is there a guaranteed minimum pay? Well, when you build a new house, you do get a minimum new house contract, and that does set the floor, and that's what the lenders are looking at when they make loan decisions on you know, whether or not to make the loan. They're basing the income, the cash flow, on the minimum new house guarantee. Um, and no, I would not like to be paid the same as everybody else. If I work harder and I do a better job, I want to get rewarded for that. Okay. Katie? I, I agree with Andrew that, um, well, I have the new houses, so I do have the new house guarantee per se, and it comes with conditions. If something were to happen and I didn't have, you know, everything in working operation, that's my responsibility, then that could affect that. But generally, I do have a guaranteed pay, and I, I'm on the same page. I, I don't, I think that the competition um, is a positive thing because I think that that uh, maintains accountability on the farm, ensures people are doing what they're supposed to be doing, and there's incentives to make sure you go above and beyond. I have to agree with that. I mean, you, you need some kind of incentive to, uh, you know, do what you're supposed to do. Uh, some people uh, uh, do more, and I've been to meetings where uh, people, well, my one or two houses, sh I shouldn't be compared to somebody, or, or I've got six houses or four houses compared to somebody with one house. Well, if you decide to build four or five houses, you got to work harder than the person has one house, mm -hmm. and that's your responsibility to maintain them, and that's the way the companies uh, structure this, you know, to keep everybody uh, competitive and uh, doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to agree. We live in America. It's all about competition, and competition is good, and, you know, the same, you know, that we get, um, you know, we, we all compete against each other, and, you know, it's, it's you know, nothing that if, you know, Bill and I grew for the same company. We may be growing, you know, for the same week, and it's kind of fun to compete against other people. And you kind of right. compare notes and how are your chickens doing? Well, mine are doing right. pretty good. Well, I think mine are doing better than yours, but you know. Right. So that's I, I think that's just um, just the American way, and I think it has worked very well for us. But it's not cutthroat competition. We all get along. Oh yeah, we do. Oh yeah, that's, right. that's true. We do. <laughs> yeah, very true. We we all get along, and we all exchange ideas because. You know, we all want to be better growers. So if we don't tell, you know, others what we're, we're, we're doing or, you know, something that may work for you that may not, you know, work for someone else. Um, Andrew, I had a question for you. They wanted to know about um, your transition from conventional um, chickens to growing organic, about how did that work? Um, well, again, I had to put in a pasture. I had to put in uh, doors to go outside and waters outside and windows and the entertainment centers. Um, the transition was fairly smooth. We did a whole house clean out, blew out all the feeders and the bins so that everything that went in there was organic from then on. Um, had to take out the dirt from our outside of around the house where I had sprayed so that everything would be organic and 
So now I do a lot of weed eating, or actually I have somebody else come in and do weed eating. Um, but the, the transition has been fairly smooth, and, and I enjoy it. Okay. All right. Good. Um, I was recently, another farmer and I were recently invited to go to Kentucky and talk to farmers down there about, and there's a big poultry operation there, and the grain farmer and myself went down, and he explained um, living uh, in Maryland and farming in Maryland was like uh, farming and living in a crime scene, that you have to document every single thing that we do. And it's, it's very true because when you travel to these other parts um, of the country, we are leaps and bounds ahead of them when you know, we told them we had to have um, nutrient management plans and some other things. So um, talk to us um, about some of the record keeping that you do. So, you know, including, you know, daily mortality and then, you know, our once, some of the, our once a year reporting and things that we have to do. Well, you have to, uh, we record uh, when we clean out, when, uh, and when we move any manure off the farm, who gets it, where it goes. Right. Uh, and you have to keep records on the mortality. And then you submit that uh, report to the state uh, every spring. Uh, and um, you're open for inspections every uh, so often when Mr. Callahan gives you a call and I'm coming around to check your records and mm -hmm. I think I had an inspection from MDE uh, a few months ago so mm -hmm. it's uh, you better keep everything uh, wrote down because uh, that's, right. that's where my wife comes in handy because she's good at keeping records for I'm not. Saying. You better have a good bookkeeper in the family, That's right? right? That's yeah. right. It's kind of like nursing. If it's not documented, it's not done. So it all has to be there. So I was kind of used to that from, you know, nursing. But yeah. I'm just getting used to all the documentation with poultry because I'm kind of new. Right. So we fill out our AIR reports every year. Um, That's annual, annual implementation, implementation report. reports. And you have to uh, have your CAFO permit, um, which you apply for generally every five years. And then with the organic, not only are we inspected by MDE and MDA, but also the organic certification folks and the GAP certification folks. And we have to keep a file on every flock where anything that goes in that chicken house is uh, that you keep a record of it. So when we are... Um we're inspected by lots of lots of different um, agencies, and so every day we, you know, we record our mortality. You know how many have died. You know how many calls there were. Um, if we're at a certain threshold of dead um, birds, we have to call our service person. So we have a service person that comes to our farm once a week that works with us. Um, so there's lots of lots of record keeping that that we have to do, and it's it's continual, um, um, pretty much um, all the time. So. Um, I think that was all on record keeping. Um, this question was about air quality for chicks being important. What are the, some of the methods that you use to control ammonia in your houses? Well, first of all, you want to start off with dry litter. Um, the drier the litter, the less the ammonia that you have. Um, we've used various products over time. The most common one for conventional chickens is uh, PLT, or poultry litter treatment. Uh, but there's a lot of other ones out there, alum and some other things like that. With uh, the organic, we use poultry guard, and also uh, there's another, there's a couple other products that are uh, okayed by the organic certification folks. But the main thing is to start out with dry litter and run the ventilation, uh, keep the air quality good with the fans. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually carry I carry an ammonia meter when I go in, at least for the first few weeks until there's a lot of fans running. But um, and it tells me, you know, in real time, it, it alarms me when it's high, or, and I can keep an eye on it. And I titrate my fan time based on the ammonia. So if the ammonia is a little higher, I bump my fan time up, and it comes down. I have to have uh, with all the years I got in, I have to have ammonia gun to uh, see what because I can't mm. smell anymore. Oh, no. but, uh, but, uh, I agree with Andrew. Uh, with having our own uh, crusting equipment and the way we do it. The sooner you can get the houses cleaned out and get ready for the next flock, the sooner it starts drying and run your fans in between to dry them, uh, litter out, the better off you're gonna be. And then mm -hmm. you just have to uh, 
ventilate well enough to keep that ammonia lo uh, low. Because right. the better, uh, the lower the ammonia, the better your flock's going to do. Right. And a lot of us have to record that whatever that reading is. We carry that ammonia meter, and we have to record that every day. We have to on our mortality sheet, um, record keeping sheet, I should call it. Um, we have to record what those parts per million were because there's a threshold that that it, that it needs to be under, certainly for sure. Um, so we heard. Um, Bill Satterfield talked earlier about um, the cost of, of growing chickens, and certainly electricity is one of those um, huge costs for us. So um, do any of you have solar panels, or are you thinking about um, putting in any type of solar? Well, I had, uh, I had a couple of, I'm considering uh, putting solar in my place. I've had a couple of them uh, come in and give me some estimates, but I haven't sold my wife on it yet. So. Okay. Uh, but I, I think it's a good idea, so. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. just getting going, so I haven't looked into it yet. In about six weeks, I'll have solar panels. Oh, very good. Um, you know, the challenge with uh, poultry houses is the first nine, ten years, um, you have plenty of depreciation and interest expense but then that drops off and your taxes start going up. So it starts to make solar look better, but of course you're still making regular payments. So it's all about cash flow. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, it's very true. Um, so I think we have certainly heard from um, some poultry farmers that have put in solar and are very, very happy with um, what, you know, what is happening. So a lot of it depends on your financial situation. That, um, where that can use. So this next question is about um, the use of an antibiotics. So tell us on your operation, um, are you using antibiotics? Um, are you not? Why do some farms avoid them? Why do some farms use them? I do not use them. Um, I'm an antibiotic free farm with Alan Hurim. I know that in certain cases, if the animals get sick enough and the mortality is high enough that they may um, have to run antibiotics on them. Um, and then they're sold differently, they're, they're marketed oh. differently from the company standpoint. But mm -hmm. I, I do not use antibiotics. I use, um, I think the things we can use are oregano oil, which is called something else, but essentially it's oregano mm -hmm. oil mixed with a couple other things. There's a couple other things that they'll give, and I'm not certain Miss Jenny might know more. Yeah. But um, no, I, I don't use any. Well, I grow from out there, and uh, um, you know, unless the mortality is up, we, we don't run any antibiotics. Right. So. Right. Andrew? Organic, no antibiotics. Yeah. Oregano. Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> are we having Italian chickens now? We're raising our <laughs> pre season chicken. <laughs> oh, pre season. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. So, yeah, we've run some of that. So, um, you know, uh, consumer pressure has a lot to do with um, the things, you know, that, that we grow and that, and that we do. And, you know, I, I am um, happy um, to raise a conventional bird um, when, you know, I grow antibiotic-free bird, antibiotic birds now, but when we grew conventional birds, I mean, we did not. People think that we ran antibiotics 24-7. Um, no, we didn't. It was only when our chickens were sick. And I use the analogy, if your kids are sick, you take them to the doctor and they get treated with antibiotics. Well, it was the same with us. As poultry growers, we knew when our chickens were sick, we would call our service tech. They would take chickens, they would take them to the lab, they would take them to the company vet, and then the company vet um, would prescribe um, the antibiotics. But I'm happy to grow um, whatever the consumer wants, as long as the consumer knows that it's going to cost more money for us to raise an antibiotic-free bird, it's going to cost more money for us um, to grow an organic bird, it's going to take more resources, like Bill Satterfield said this morning, we can't put as many, how, many birds in a house now. So as long as the consumer understands that, I'm happy to grow what they want as long as I'm going to be compensated for it. Well, the other thing about the, uh, if there's any need for running the antibiotics, their own restrictions have been on it for years. Right. Uh, you only can run it at a certain time. They got to have a withdrawal, right. so they're not sending out right. chickens full of antibiotics. Right. They, they've got a withdrawal. If you get to a certain age, that's um, right. You got to ride it out, and that's all it is to it. Yeah, uh, that's right. There has to be that 14-day window right. of um, no right. antibiotics. You're not, if, you're you know, not if they were right, fresh on antibiotics. And the meat is tested to make sure that there, exactly. you know, there's no no antibiotic, you know, residue or anything um, in the meat. Andrew, did you have something else? I was going to say I was I I was never as a conventional grower, and I am not now worried about antibiotics and yeah. 
Chicken. Um, eating well is real easy. You walk the perimeter of the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, that's and everything yeah. in moderation. Yeah, I've heard that. Um, let's um, talk a little bit about social media. Um, you know, there's been a real push for as farmers for us to go out and um, show people what we're doing. So tell me if any of you do anything on social media. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andrew. I know Andrew's on Facebook because he's a friend of mine. Yeah, <laughs> so I do a little bit of Facebook, and I, um, I have actually posted a couple of pictures, but I'm not an expert at it. I should do more, and as farmers, we should do more to tell our story because it is a good story. And uh, but you know, time is limited, and know, and that's... age is up there. So uh, I do it, but I should do more. Katie, do you do any? I, I have Facebook, and I get on Facebook sometimes. I post very little. Um, I'm intermittent on there. Honestly, with two jobs and three kids, I, I just don't have a lot of time. I know. I mean, I hope that one day when my kids are a little older, maybe I can have time to educate and research a little bit more. But right now, I'm kind of just trying to maintain what I've got going on. Understand. No, no I'm, uh, I'm not on Facebook or any of that. Uh, yeah. No. So I, I, think, I think that's one of the things to take away, that... Um, you know, we're all busy. And it's not that we don't want to share things, but it's hard to have the time to do that. I am on, um, I am on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. I actually work with the National Chicken Council because they want some real pictures, you know, put out there. And it doesn't always have to be something um, that's going on in the chicken house. But, you know, I take a picture of the golf cart, you know, and I put not all golf carts are used on golf courses. We use one on our farm uh, every day. So it does um, take a lot of time. And my sons do fuss at me occasionally, like, Mom, get back to work. We don't have time for this. But it is important for people, uh, I think, really to see some of the things um, that we do. All right. Let's see, we've still got about 10 minutes. So let's see. I think we talked about solar. Um, let's talk a little bit about biosecurity. So um, if everybody doesn't know what biosecurity is, so bio just means life, security means protection. So in the poultry industry, uh, we really work on biosecurity. We've probably, our industry has probably been always the big push on biosecurity um, since, you know, we had avian influenza, uh, not here, thank goodness, in 2015, but around the, um, in the Midwest and other, other, we have it in other parts of our, of our world, but uh, we work really hard to keep that out. So talk a little bit about the biosecurity practices that you do on your farms. Uh, uh, we had the foot baths for every uh, uh, chicken house and, f and uh, clothes and boots dedicated just for our farm, regardless of where we go. It, same thing, it, it's uh, uh, strict for my son because he does go to other farms, you know, keep everything separate uh, to make sure he's not bringing nothing back to us or, or we're not taking anything to anybody else and keep everything cleaned up. So, and. Uh, keep unnecessary people off the farm mm -hmm. as much as you can, so. Okay. Yeah, we have, I have foot baths and, you know, particular boots that the children, all of us have a pair of boots that stay on the farm. And we have, um, out of our four vehicles, we have certain vehicles that stay just on the farm. Um, and I know the, uh, the feed trucks, when they come in and out, they spray their tires. Um, and I, yeah, the same, I keep unnecessary people out of my service lane and out of my chicken house lane. So I have everything that they talked about, and when uh, AI was, uh, you know, really an issue about a year ago, I also went out and bought uh, shoes for each individual chicken house, just so mm -hmm. that when I walked in, I not only was stepping in a foot bath, but also putting in shoes for that uh, for that house alone, as well as uh, antiseptic for my hands and. Mm -hmm. gloves, gloves just for that house mm -hmm. good okay uh let's see do you um do you get tired of hearing about mega farms industrial farms and factory farms <laughs> and what's your answer to that when people ask you that question go ahead and start it 
I'm the new kid on the block, but I, I do. Um, and part of that's because I feel like, you know, those of us who are just trying to get in agriculture and maintain the agriculture way of life kind of get overlooked in this. Um, my farm is a family farm. I used a tenth of my entire property to cash flow my whole farm. So I have the rest of the acreage to preserve mm. the way of life that I appreciate so much, you know, being raised here on the Eastern shore. And I looked at diversify and I like to see crops grow as well. And there are crops growing on the 40 acres that I have. And we've got, um, you know, the 50 acres that is wooded and we hunt with that. And I, I do get a little tired of people kind of grouping us all together in, you know, the factory farms and, and the big chicken farms, because it's really, for the vast majority of us, it's not like that. It's a family farm. And it's a way for, like Ms. Jenny said earlier, it's a way for us to get into agriculture. Um, I couldn't have cash flowed a farm grain farming or starting a dairy operation. It just wasn't reasonable for me. Poultry was really the only way I could get my foot in the door. And I do look to diversify eventually, um, you know, once I get a handle on everything I've already got going on. Okay. Well, I do too, and I look at it as uh, 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 people on the outside trying to label uh, farmers as bad guys when you say factory farms and uh, mega farms, and, and they don't have a clue. You know, they're seeing these new houses, and they don't want them to see these new houses, mm -hmm. but it's somebody's family, just what you've seen on them pictures up there. It's somebody's family sure. running these farms, owning these farms, and doing that work. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, okay. Andrew. Uh, I take care of six houses by myself. If I was 20 years younger and a little bit more ambitious, <laughs> I could probably add another seventh or eighth house on there and do it myself. The automation and technology is there to allow for that size farm, even though a lot of folks might not like to see it. And from a banking perspective, if I had to think about, you know, what would be the ideal sized operation it would probably be three eight house farms. You could maximize your equipment. You could hire the labor that everybody wouldn't have to work, you know, all the time. And, uh, you know, that would be no different than many of our grain farms that are three, four thousand acres that have that kind of labor usage. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to shift a little bit to talk about a little bit about zoning, planning and zoning. So as uh, many of you know, um, up and down the shore, um, a lot of counties have talked about um, looking, they're kind of singling out um, the poultry industry and they want to know, you know, what are your setbacks? You know, why do they work? You know, why don't they work? Um, so this question uh, pertains to, of course, um, Queens County is looking at some of their um, setbacks. So how do you feel about if there was a 300 foot um, setback required, um, would you be for or against that? Um, do you think um, setbacks need to be larger, smaller? What are your feelings on zoning issues? 300 foot setback is not an issue. Um, I think that uh, you can mitigate some of the setback by having uh, broader uh, buffers. buffers. And the other thing that I would be very much in favor of is reverse setbacks. You know, in an agricultural area, that farm field, there's a commercial operation happening there. Even a woodland, there's a commercial operation happening there. There's a crop being grown that's going to be harvested at some time. Um, with poultry houses, there's a commercial operation happening there. Our problem is not necessarily with a, a Walmart distribution center going in across the street. It's with housing going in. So having reverse setbacks for putting housing in the agricultural area is what I would like to say. Do you have any thoughts, Kate? I think a 300 foot setback would be fine. Um, Caroline County, when I started mine, I think, I assume it's still the same, it was 200 feet, but I actually went above and beyond that. Mine are, they met the DPI standard, which was 400, I believe, the new standard. Um, and I, when I looked at, you know, the grid and I designed everything. I actually had my neighbors in mind. Some people might not think that, but I had my neighbors in mind, my fan banks, the way I aim my fan banks, the way I laid my houses out, the way I have my driveways, it was all considered at that point in time. And um, you know, my fans, the, the person that they're blowing the most on is me. You know, they're my chickens, I don't mind. But you know, I, I do take that into consideration. And I think it's a good thing that you know, people are made to be cognizant of that because we do have neighbors and neighbor relations are important. I have to agree with that. I, um, you know, to try, for the most part, work with your neighbors with 300 foot, I don't have any problem. And uh, I think all the houses now are built with set or the uh, buffers in mind. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's a 
uh, mm -hmm. plus from what it was years ago, but I mean, uh, if you always, like Katie, you're trying to work with your neighbors, right. who are going to be reasonable too, uh, knowing that you own the property and you plan on doing this, it work, as long as it works out for everybody, okay. uh, I right. don't have a problem with that. Okay. I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, so this is, uh, what is your greatest challenging in dis selling or um, it says disposing of, which I don't like that because we don't dispose of our litter. We uh, recycle our litter so or our manure. So um, do you have any challenges? Maybe that would be the question in um, selling your manure or finding someone or litter that you know may take it. So talk a little bit about, about that. Well, um, me personally, I don't have any uh, challenges because I got them knocking on my door trying to, right. uh, if I had more, I could, uh, I could sell more. But uh, right now I've got uh, a couple of good guys, actually uh, three guys that uh, share local, my- Local farmers. Local farmers. Grain farmers. And uh, I, uh, I got one main, well, they're all local uh, neighbors. And like I said, I got people knocking on my door now looking for manure. Uh, if I had it, and so I have no problem getting okay. rid of it. Okay. So. Katie? Yeah, I've had people, I mean, I haven't exported really any because obviously this is the first time I've crossed it out and taken any manure out of the house, but um, people have, since I began construction, been asking what I'm going to do with the manure. So I have a list of, you know, who got on the list first, basically, and if they wanted it, they want, but it has not been a challenge to find somebody to take it. Okay, good. The only challenge is having too many people. <laughs> <laughs> True. Okay. Well, um, let's give our panel um, a round of applause. They did a great job. So, thank you all. Thank you very much.